in our lives. I can remember coming to church uh, years ago and sitting in the church and fighting battles in my mind. And the Lord would encourage me, not only through uh, the preaching of God's word, but the fellowship of the saints. And it's the encouragement of knowing that there's a greater hope beyond this life. And what we have to do nowadays, saints, is that we have to get in the fight. We got to stick in the battle. And we have to, as one writer said, I think it was Peter, that said in one place, we have to save ourselves from this untoward generation. We have to live up to uh, the standard of the scriptures, live holy. And the Bible said, uh, them that love his appearance, will he appear, as it were, uh, with glory and might. I think the scripture speaks along that, that line. But um, we should be loving his appearance. And the Lord is certainly showing himself faithful. I don't know if anybody, if everybody's been made aware, there has been another uh, school shooting. Um, and we certainly should be praying for these individual saints that God would uh, grant them comfort. Um, these things are becoming more and more prevalent in our day. And it's because, of course, to a certain degree, uh, the scriptures are being fulfilled that we are living in perilous times. And men are doing all type of things. And I was thinking about this before I came off of Bible class. One of the ways, saints, that we know that a society is becoming more and more um, depraved, if I can use that terminology, is that when it begins to prey on, the, on its own innocent. Amen. Um, this is something that happened even with Israel, where the Bible talked about that they would allow their children to pass through the fire. Uh, that simply spoke of human sacrifice. And when our children are being gunned down in their classrooms uh, by their peers and sometimes by adults, we see this stuff going on in the world, it's because society is becoming more and more depraved and more and more um, uh, the social agendas of our day are taking over. And it is also a reflection on what America is doing to train up their children. You see, we were taught years ago, um, and even in our schools, that uh, some of you had Bibles in your schools. Uh, they would read the Bible. I remember when I was a child that, um, uh, you know, we were allowed to do things that we can't do now. Um, the, uh, the word of God was, was more accepted in that day. Um, but you're seeing now, saints, that there is a, uh, a state of chaos within our school systems, mainly because we have locked God out. Can the church say amen? Uh, and we are allowing all type of things to come in and take its place. And it's producing uh, this type of violence in the world. And I want to let you know exactly what is taking place is simply that the prince of the power of the air, the spirit, as the scripture said, that work in the, diso uh, in the uh, children of disobedience is ruling in this world. And it's getting into these young people's minds and into their hearts and causing them to have no value for human life. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, these video games that a lot of times our children are, are watching, um, and I, I don't know why I'm saying this tonight, but I think it's important that we as, I have young children, and as parents and also grandparents, that every opportunity that we have with our children, we try to impart unto them uh, the things of God. Uh, fulfill the scripture where he says, raise up a child in the way that it ought to go, and when it is old, will not depart, simply give them the knowledge and um, uh, the concept of God. Uh, some of us did not all, all, did not all receive our first concept of God in the apostolic church, but we came to the knowledge of the truth because at some point somebody introduced us and told us about the power of God. And some of us were led into this truth some of us was raised up in this truth, but nevertheless, we've made it. And so getting back to what I was saying earlier is that, saints, because of these video games and the violence that is on the television, a lot of these children don't have a concept of what reality is. 
They have no concept of what is right and wrong in the fact that when you shoot somebody, they don't come back to life like they come back to life in a video game. It is a whole different concept. They're, they're, they're actually, they're living in a state of altered reality to where they think that these games that they play, um, they can en enact these acts of violence and all of a sudden it'll be okay. And so we have to be very careful. This is the reason why I am an advocate for safe games. Praise the Lord. I'm an advocate for activity. Because when we were growing up, we were outside playing. We were doing things with our bodies. Now children are in front of a television screen for hours on end playing video games. And it's, none of it is real. But in their minds, it seems real. And so we should be praying. I think this was the second school shooting that happened in a matter of weeks or days, if memory serves me correctly. There was one in uh, Santa Fe, Houston, right? Texas, in Texas, just outside of uh, Houston, Texas, right? And then there was another one just today uh, in Indiana. See, this stuff is no joke. And I uh, was telling, Amy, she's not here tonight, that we have to hold our children close. We have to pray for our children. Um, I never would have thought that I would see a day when, I'll be, when I would be afraid to send my children to school. And my personal opinion is that they need to actually start putting, um, this is what I think, Bishop, whether or not they do it, I don't know, but they need to put metal detectors in schools. They need to lock the doors put metal detectors in school and have maybe some armed guards or something. Because if I guarantee you, if there was somebody out there that had a firearm, and I'm not saying we should have firearms, I'm just advocating the fact that there needs to be some protection. Because the Bible did say in one place that he, that uh, concerning the minister of the Lord, that he beareth not the sword in vain. That's simply to make the point that there are those in the world that have those jobs to protect and serve. Now we as children of God, we don't bear arms, but God does have those that can do that job. You follow what I'm saying? Such as a police officer. He has a job. If you take him away, society would be very, very difficult to live in because there are a lot of crazy people in the world that don't think straight. But I guarantee if there was somebody outside of a school with the same pistol that they got, they wouldn't be running up in the school shooting up, shooting up little kids. Praise the Lord. Now, I'm not advocating violence. Don't get me wrong. I'm just simply making the point that if they did some of these things, it would probably stop these, these, these individuals from just doing this stuff blatantly. Because what's happening is that in many, in many of our schools, the doors are open. People can walk right into the school. Um, and so there has to be some actions that, um, that can be um, that can be done to try to safeguard our children because the devil is crazy. And if you listen to him, he'll make you crazy too. Oh, I'm telling the truth. And these people are listening to the enemy speak to them. And uh, these, all this stuff that people are doing, we got to be careful. That's the reason why I decided that during a certain portion of the service, let's lock the doors. Because, you know, we trust the Lord and we uh, don't believe in violence. I don't advocate it. I don't care firearm. I don't think it's, it's necessary. I don't think it's uh, scriptural. Uh, God will protect, take care of us, but we do have to have some wisdom because we just don't know what people will do. Amen. Praise the Lord. And so we're just living in a wicked day. And I want Jesus to come. <laughs> you know, because, you know, uh, I would have never thought that we would be in this time where people are doing these things and... Um, it doesn't even phase individuals. And what you're finding is these individuals are becoming more and more blatant in their actions. They're bold. They've been emboldened because they think it's a game. A matter of fact, I was just reading up on one, uh, uh, or listening to one video of one shooting that happened a couple years ago where a teenage boy came into the school. He had an altercation with another young man, confronted what thought he did of something was being said, and he shot the young man twice. Um, and he got 13 years or something like this. And I'm thinking to myself, now if this young man died, you would have gave him life. Now I'm not, I'm not advocating violence at all. I'm just simply making the point that if you are big enough to go and shoot somebody, 
you don't need to be out in the street. You need to spend, your, spend the rest of your life because you knew what you were doing. I mean, this is a 17-year-old kid. I think he was probably like 16, 17. And if you could take a gun to school, hunt somebody down, and shoot them in cold blood. Now, thankfully, the young man survived the shooting. And this boy was so paranoid, he wouldn't go out of his house. Uh, he, he wore bulletproof vests everywhere he went. I mean, his, he was traumatized because he almost lost his life. And so my thought, and this is just my opinion, maybe I shouldn't be saying this, but I just think if, if, these, if we start handing out some stiffer penalties, then maybe these people will stop doing this stuff. Praise the Lord. Because sometimes uh, these young men think and young women think that they can just do this and all of a sudden I'm just going to go to juvie or I'm going to be out in 10 or 15 years. Well, whether or not the people that you shoot die or not, you shouldn't be left, you shouldn't get out on the street because, of the, because this is no joke. Can the church say amen? I just believe that. Now, that's my personal opinion. Uh, but these things, saints, are just simply evil. We're in an evil day. So pray for your children, saints. Raise them up in the way of God uh, and give them an opportunity to know the truth because we are just in a bad day today and we need the Lord to help us. Can the church say amen? All right. Let's uh, now get back into the scripture here that we've been dealing with on Friday night, which is more of a um, saints meeting Bible, Bible class, which deals with seven particular deceptions of the church. There are seven things that the enemy is trying to deceive God's people with. He's trying to pull the wool over our eyes and make uh, the church feel that these things that we're going to try to go over in this Bible class are acceptable uh, and in the sight of God. And they're actually uh, simply things that will cause an individual to lose their ability to walk with God and, of course, be saved. Number one is they say, this is what uh, the enemy is trying to uh, say to individuals, that Christians, uh, that a Christian can be carnal and be saved. Now, the term carnal simply means walking according to the flesh, metaphorically speaking, walking according to the fallen nature. Number two, that all Christians sin. Number three, that Christians cannot stop sinning. Number four is that God loves everyone uncondition, unconditionally, and that is a doctrine of, of uh, excuse me, unconditional eternal security, which simply means that no matter what you do, God loves you anyway, and he will overlook the actions that a person does contrary to his will. Uh, that is number four. Number five is that, uh, that everyone is our neighbor, and because of that, we're all God's children. Now, we have to understand there's a difference. There's your neighbor, your brother, uh, naturally speaking, fellow man, but then there's your neighbor, your brother in Christ. And so what they try to say, Sharon, is that we're all neighbors, so we're all God's children. Now, this is false doctrine. This is what the devil wants to make everybody think, that everybody is a child of God, no matter what you do. So we're going to give you some scriptures by the end of this Bible class to make the point that there's a, there's a difference between the children of God and the children of the enemy or the children of the wicked one. Can the church say amen? Because there are two family saints that are in the earth today. They are God's children or his sheep, and then there are the children of the devil. Because the Bible said Cain was of his father, who? The devil. Can the church say amen? That's the reason why. When his works were ungodly and his works were found to be wrong or sinful, what did he do? He rose up against his brother, his fellow brother, his fellow man, which was who? Abel. And what did he do? Slew him. And Abel became the first martyr in your Bible who died in Christ. He was the first individual who died in the faith. Can the church say amen? That would be number six excuse me, number five, and then number six, is that a person can fail their trials and God will overlook them. What that simply means is that an individual can continue to fail the grace of God, the power of God in their life, and they can still be saved. Number seven is that there is no such thing as living holy. 
These are seven particular deceptions that the enemy tries to bring to the church and make one feel like these things are acceptable in the eyesight of God. So as a place to start tonight, we're going to go back to uh, Romans chapter number 8, I think it is, is where we left off. And we're going to deal with number one, and that is carnal saints or carnal Christians will be saved. Can the church say amen? So let's look at this tonight, and then we're going to go into dealing with the second deception, second and third deceptions, if the Lord allow tonight so we can try to uh, progress through this Bible class. The Lord is trying to get the church ready. Can the church say amen? Let's go back to verses numbers one, and this is going to make the point as to why God manifested himself in a human body was that so that he could destroy the works of the devil, so that he can destroy and abolish sin in our members. Can the church say amen? So he can destroy what the enemy started when he himself ro rose up against God, praise the Lord, and deceived and tricked himself out of heaven because the Bible is clear that he was the anointed, anointed, anointed excuse me, cherub that covereth. He was in heaven. He had one of the greatest positions that anyone could ever have. He was over the heavenly host. He was actually the most beautiful thing that God had ever made up until that point. And because of his pride, the Bible said he was lifted up in pride. And so this is a big problem today is that people get proud and they don't want to be dealt with. And so this is exactly what the devil did. Uh, Lucifer, who became the devil, he lifted up in pride. He saw how beautiful he was, and he decided that he was going to be like the Most High. Praise the Lord. And because of that, he fell, and somebody say sin, and became the tempter. Because the scripture says, Sister Julian, that he sinneth from the beginning. So the author and the father of sin is who? Satan, the wicked one, the devil, the dragon, slew foot, whatever you want to call him. He's no good. Can the church say amen? And anybody that follows him will also be in the same predicament that he will be because the scripture said unto him and the, uh, the fallen angels there is change reserved under darkness. There's a reservation waiting for Satan and the fallen angels and that is the lake that burneth with fire and brimstone. Do you follow what I'm saying tonight? And so when Jesus Christ came, he came to destroy those works and to deliver us from the carnality that is within these bodies. You follow what I'm saying? So let's read in verses numbers uh, one. Read, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. The term walk here is metaphoric. He doesn't mean literally walking in your body because all of us are walking in our natural bodies. He's talking about spiritually speaking, we do not walk after the fallen nature that is in the body. All right, let's read. Mm -hmm. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ has made us free from the law of sin and death. And where's the law of sin and death at? It is in your members. But the law of the spirit of life in Christ or the gospel of Jesus Christ that freed us from the law that is in these natures to overcome what is in the flesh. The gospel freed us from that and the obedience to the same in walking with God. Praise the Lord. Freed us from that. Freed us from what we could not overcome, which was in these bodies. Can the church say amen? All right, let's read here. For, read, for what the law could not do. Now the law was what? Perfect. Isn't that right? The law had no imperfections, but the law could not bring about perfection. It simply gave the knowledge of what, what, what was right and what was wrong. It would be no different than if you gave a child that is two or three years old a physics book. He has no knowledge and no ability to be able to understand anything in that book. Can the church say amen? Even if he was able to read it, let's just say the child was able to read it, he has no experience with it. He has no knowledge. He has no ability to be able to solve the equations. Some of us... Um, who are of age, 
have no clue what physics is, like myself. Can the church say amen? I didn't even, go, I didn't even try those, those classes in, in school. Because I knew I wasn't going to pass them anyway. Can the church say amen? I'm talking about me today. But simply to make the point that the law was perfect, but it was given to people that were imperfect. Can the church say amen? So, all right, so let's, let's, let's read here. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, it was given to flesh. It was given to, to those individuals in that day that were carnal. It was given to Israel, and they were in their flesh. You follow what I'm saying? An individual, uh, Sister uh, Sherry, could bring the sacrifice that was prescribed under the law uh, that Moses gave in the morning. And by the time afternoon came, they would have been in sin again. Why? Because they could not refrain themselves from falling under the carnality that Adam sold them, sold them under in the whole human family. For the Bible said all have sinned and come short to the, of the glory of God. The term have is important because all of us were in that condition. Praise the Lord. And the law was given to individuals that was in the condition of sin, but could not overcome it. But let's look at what Jesus, somebody said, look at what Jesus did. Because he made a difference in our life that we could not make for ourselves. So this is simply to solve uh, all of the arguments that people make that individuals now that we are in the church and we have been baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost, that we can be carnal. That means walk after the fallen nature and still be saved. You're going to see as we read along that that is totally false because now we have power over that which is in these bodies and it is now being brought into subjection and the works of the enemy is being abolished within us as we, live, as we walk with God. Every day, saints, that you live holy, you are actually proving the scriptures right and the devil a liar. Can the church say amen? Every day that we w wake up and choose to serve God, we are showing that our adversary, our accuser, is false, and God's word has power. We're going to read a scripture in a little bit where the Bible said, I don't know if we're going to get to it tonight, where God told a woman to go and sin no more. And if she believed that word, she could have left there and never sinned again, because that's how much power God word, God, God's word has. Has, excuse me. All right, let's read here. Um, he says, for the law of the spirit of Christ has made us free from the law of sin and death. Read, for what the law could not do in, the, in that was weak through the flesh. Now, this is what God did. God sent his own son. Now, what was that body? That was God's own body. That was God's son. That body was his son. Can the church say amen? God sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Or he sent them in the image of a man. Praise the Lord. He sent them in the likeness of flesh that was sinful. He was not a sinner. The Bible said he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now the one thing that we have to understand is that the reason why God manifest himself in flesh was just so he can afflict the punishment of sin upon his own body. So when Jesus... Uh, Sister Delpha, or God saw that body that he was in on the cross, he saw him not as his son, he saw him as the body that he was inflicting the punishment for sin upon. Praise the Lord. You follow what I'm saying? The scripture said it pleased God to bruise him. God bruised his own body on the cross so that he did not, so that he would not bruise ours through us accepting what he gave us. So this is the reason why sin has no more dominion over us because it was abolished through Jesus Christ. The ability, I should say, of sin being uh, can be abolished through Jesus Christ and us walking with him. And that's the reason why carnality is sin. Walking after the flesh is sin because now we have the power to overcome it. Can the church say amen? We have the ability to overcome that which is, that which is within us. I, I guess I should, I should say it like this, that now 
that we have the ability to overcome it, there's no excuse. Let me correct myself, because sin has always been in the world. But now there is no excuse for that which is wrong. Why? Because Jesus, God in Christ, came in the likeness of sinful flesh. He looked like a man, but he was uh, walk like a man, talk like a man, but he had the nature of God in him. And what did he do? He destroyed. Praise the Lord. He is going to destroy and is destroying the works of the devil. He started it in us as we walk with God after the spirit. You follow what I'm trying to say tonight? All right, let's read here. All right. Likeness of sinful flesh and what? For sin condemned or he judged sin in the flesh. He condemned it. What he did was, was show that there is a way to overcome sin that is in these members. You follow what I'm saying? Read. Let's go. Verse 4. That the righteousness. Now why did he do that? That this could happen. That the righteousness of God might, might be what? Fulfilled. Now, now why did he say might? Because some will let it be fulfilled and some won't. Some might let the righteousness of God be fulfilled in them and some won't allow it to. Because the way to overcome carnality is to allow the spirit of God to control one's members. But because of the false prophets and the deception, as we're teaching tonight, one of these seven deceptions is that they're teaching that all um, that carnal Christians can be saved because God will excuse whatever it is that we do. God will not excuse whatever it is that we do. No different than if we don't excuse our children from the things that they do. Can the church say amen? If your children was walking around with a butcher knife hacking up your furniture, you're not going to say, well, it's all right, baby. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I know, you know, see, we, I grew up in a day, well, you remember, remember back in the day when you couldn't go in the living room? You sit on your mother's furniture. Praise the Lord. Y'all looking at me like, y'all remember that? There were certain places that you couldn't go. You remember your grandma used to have that furniture covered in that plastic? Y'all here, y'all looking at me like, you better not go in there and sit on that. Go in there and sit on there and watch what happened. And we didn't move stuff out of the way back then. My mother said, don't touch it. That's right. Now we moving, they got child locks on everything. Well, no child locks back then. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. If you got your house child proof, praise the Lord. But back in the day, when, ma when mama put something on the counter, put her little knickknacks on the table, you didn't go in there. And if you did, that was the last time. You follow what I'm trying to say here? What I'm trying to say is that now there is no excuse. Why? Because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. So he says that the righteousness of the, righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk, what? Not after, now this walk is metaphoric. We walk, spiritually speaking, not after the nature of the fallen man, but after the spirit. Can the church say amen? We're walking according to the knowledge of God that he's given us in his word and is keeping us walking spiritually. Walking in a state of mind that produces life, godliness, holiness, and righteousness. You follow what I'm saying? Paul is making a powerful um, point to the uh, church at Rome. is that now that you are born again, if the righteousness of God is going to be fulfilled in you, you cannot walk, you cannot live after the flesh. The Bible said if any man lives after the flesh, he'll die. If I'm only living elder for my body, my body is in, has an insatiable desire for all things contrary to God. You ever met somebody that they just can't get enough of something, even though they know Sister Delphi hurts them? Some people know that what they're doing is damaging, but they cannot stop themselves because the body, if we walk after the flesh, we walk after the fallen nature, the body has, an, has the insatiable desire to do that which is contrary to God's will, and it will never have enough. The eye is never full of seeing. The flesh is never full of wanting. 
That's the why I, mean, I, I, I use this analogy all the time. A man or woman can have a husband at home that takes care of them, that loves them. But if he or she does not check themselves, their insatiable desire and the fallen nature will lead them to drink water from somebody's own, somebody else's sister, as, as, uh, as the preacher tells us. Because the flesh is always wanting something different. Praise the Lord. That's the reason why we got to be careful as to where we go. We have to be careful as to what we watch. Because once you allow your flesh to get a taste of something, you will have to fight that for the rest of your life. You can't miss, honey, what you ain't never had. But if you had something, you just may miss it. You follow what I'm trying to tell you tonight? Ain't no kids in here. I'm teaching. Praise the Lord. So stay away from it. Run from it. What did, jo what did Joseph do? He ran. He said, you can have this coat. I'm out of here. Praise the Lord. Don't sit there and play with it. Because, see, this is what people do. Can I talk to you for a minute? See, the flesh is such that it will tell you you can handle something. Oh, it tell you, oh, no, you got control over it. It's like that little bear, that little bear cub that's born. It's real cute when it's, when it's born, isn't it? It looks so nice. You play with it. You put it on, you put it on your show. You carry it and give it a bottle. Isn't that right? Isn't what we do? You give it the... Y'all looking at me like, what you talking about, Pastor? We give it a bottle. Isn't that what they do? The zookeeper go on the cage when the mother's up and give it a bottle. They ain't got no mother to feed it. The next thing you know, it gets a little bigger and then it chews the nipple of the bottle. And all the milk spills out. And they say, well, it don't want milk no more. Now we got to give it some food. And then it grows. Then it grows. Then eventually it looks at you like it's food. Like you the food. Praise the Lord. Yo, I, I, one, one day I was watching this. Uh, I'm, I'm moving on from this, but I want to show you something. I was watching a nature show. No, it wasn't a nature show. It was these individuals that go to zoos. And they get too close to the animals. One lady, there was a polar bear. Polar bear was behind the, was, was behind the, the, uh, the, what they call it, the bars. But she wanted to go, she jumped over the barrier, wanted to go up to the polar bear and say, hi, polar bear. How are you today? Polar bear said, I'm hungry. This polar bear reached out his paw. And these, 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 I mean, these things are huge. Reached out his paw, grabbed the woman, pulled her. Listen to me. Tried to pull this woman through the bars. They, I don't know how they got the woman loose. You follow what I'm saying? See, she was playing with something that was dangerous. She thought it was a game. But the polar bear said, you get one step closer, I got you. Praise the Lord. You follow what I'm saying? It took all of their might to get that woman loose from that polar bear. He was trying to do everything he can to get some fresh meat. Because whatever they were feeding behind them bars wasn't cutting it. You follow what I'm saying? So the point I'm saying is that you can't play with carnality. And this is the reason why I'm teaching this, because carnality breeds enmity. It breeds a place where we become an enemy of God. When I give in to my old nature, it will cause that nature to, to override you understand what I'm saying? To override the spirit. Because the Holy Ghost does not make me do anything that I don't want it. You follow what I'm saying? See, <laughs> the Holy Spirit will give us guidance. It will give us instruction. It will give us warning. But it does not tell me, it does not handcuff me, excuse me, and make me stop. I have to... Uh, I have to heed the warnings and yield to the spirit. That's the reason why I'm teaching this tonight, because this is one of the biggest deceptions that the enemy brings, that a person can, be, can walk carnal, can only think about the flesh, and they'll be saved anyhow, because God will overlook everything that they do. All right, we walk not after the flesh, but what? After the spirit. Read. Verse 5. Read. For they that are after the flesh do mind. The term mind here, I wanted you to make notes. 
their mind, their will, their perception, their reason, their intents, their desires are engineered after the fallen nature. That's what he said. They read, for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. The only thing that they're concerned about is what pleases the old man. The perception. Now, we're in Bible class. Being in Bible class does not please your flesh. Some of y'all are tired. You had long days of work. Your head hurt. Your feet are hurting. And everything else is hurting. Them pews are hard. Praise the Lord. Y'all looking at me like, I'm, I'm trying to, I, I'm, I'm, isn't that right? But you, your spirit man, that's what we're talking about, walking in the spirit. Your spirit man said this is the place to be. And so because you're walking in the spirit, you allow the spirit to lead you to where the spirit wanted you to go. But they that walk after the flesh, their perception, they're constantly perceiving things after the fallen nature. They're thinking, the way they reason, their, intent, their intentions, their desires are only engineered around this world. Everything is concerning this life. Let me show you a scripture to make that point. Let's read now in Matthew. We're going to come back to this. Matthew chapter 6, verse number 21. We're going to talk about, our, somebody say, your value. your value. Your value. This is what this scripture is going to make the point tonight. What do we value? People that walk in the spirit value different things than people that walk carnally. Praise the Lord. Chapter 6. And we only want one verse here. Verses number 21. This speaks of what we value. These are basic biblical principles that God is giving us in the church today as, we are, as he teaches um, them here uh, uh, at the Sermon on the Mount from chapters number 5 through the end of chapters number 7. These are basic principles. The late Bishop L.A. Brisbane described it as the genesis of the New Testament. This is the first time that Jesus is preaching and or teaching in the New Testament for at least Two or three chapters, he's giving us some fundamentals as to principles that it has to be a part of the Christian character, the Christian's character and or their, their uh, constitution, what they live by. You follow what I'm trying to say here? You, we have to have these things in us if we're going to be successful. Let's read verse 21. 6 and 21, read. For where your treasure is, the turn, stop right there. Your treasure in this scripture has to do with your value system. So what you deem important, what you deem valuable, what you perceive or think or reason or intend to be important. Let's read here. There will your heart be also your mind. The term heart in here is not the, the, the vessel that pumps blood. Blood. This has to do with Sister uh, Johnson, Brother Johnson, the mind. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. You are what you think about. So if I'm thinking about God, then if, let me give you an example to show you. If I'm thinking about God and my mind is on the things of God, I will be led by God to do the things that please him. You follow what I'm saying? That's why the scripture said, whatever, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are pure, whatever things have a good report, think on those things. If we think the right way, then we'll do the right things. That's the reason why these young, these young men are going up into these schools and shooting up stuff because all they do is sit behind a television screen for eight and nine hours shooting, playing Call of Duty. Shoot. Now, when I was growing up, there was a game called Doom. I mean, that old game, they, they, all they did was sit there and, and these big uh, what they, I don't know, monsters, whatever they were. I wasn't into none of that stuff. See, I was, I was an athlete. I was playing sports. I wasn't sitting there watching no TV all day. I was trying to get out of the house. The house was like jail to me. <laughs> you remember that? My, our mothers used to have to call us from the, you, know, you remember that? And you better come home too. 
She didn't come. Oh, let me talk for a minute. See, our parents didn't come looking for us. If she, if mama or daddy had to come looking for you, ooh, you were in trouble. You knew where you were supposed to be. You better be in a place where they can find you. Praise the Lord. Amen. I remember I gave you the, uh, the testimony when I was young. My mother used to call me in here going to go get, get this for me. I'm like, you in the house? Well, I, was, I couldn't say that. You better go get whatever she said. It could be right. She could be sitting down and it was in the other room. You better go get it too. Because nowadays kids start to stumping and walking around. No, 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 no. We, we, we can do that. Praise the Lord. My mother wasn't playing. Y'all, y'all, I'm about to... I'm having a flash, but let's get back in the spirit here. All right, but in any case, where a man's treasure is, there is his heart also. What I value, saints, is where I'll be at. So when it comes to walking after the spirit, if I value the things that are spiritual, I will set my affections upon those things. If I value my, my salvation, then I'll obey his word. So this is a deception that people have is that God overlooks everything that people do. Now, that has to be false because if, if we see it within our own nature that we don't accept everything. Can the church say hallelujah? Do you accept anything that anybody does? If you're a supervisor and you are supervising people and your, uh, your responsibility is to make sure that the job is done, you can't allow people to do anything they want to do. I remember years ago when I was out in the workforce and I had, I was a journeyman and I was running jobs. I couldn't just allow God, guys to come to work when they wanted to, do whatever kind of work that they wanted to, because at the end of the day, when my boss came to me and said, well, Dorian, is the job done? And I vouched and said, yes, it is done. When the inspector showed up and my boss was there, because that's when the boss showed up, my owner would show up and we're walking the job site. And they're looking up in the ceiling. They're seeing open junction boxes. They're seeing wire nuts not on wires. They're seeing lights that don't come on. He's going to look at me like, what am I paying you for? You're fired. Praise the Lord. This is exactly what will happen. So if God, if God, excuse me, if we don't accept that behavior, how much more God? You follow what I'm trying to say here? So when we deal with carnality and we deal with verse 5, let's go back to verse 5 now. We're going to wrap this portion up tonight, and we're going to get into deception number two and three, is that all Christians commit sin. That is false. That is another deception. Let's read here. It said, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. Those that are in the spirit mind the things of the spirit. They think upon the things that God thinks upon. And what God is trying to do now, Elder, he's trying to influence my thinking. That's what Bible class is designed for. That's why the reason why there's a washing of the water by the word, because God gives us the scriptures to influence what, the way we think that will, that will actually change one's behavior. See, the mind says it's a powerful tool. You follow what I'm saying? Remember I gave you the example of the Navy SEAL that they train for months and months on end? They train those gentlemen to kill people. Yes, you, you understand that? They are trained killers. Now they're killing for the sake of their country. I understand what I'm saying, but people don't want me to say, let's say this, but it's the truth. They train those guys to be battle hardened. They train them guys to compartmentalize the way they think. They take away their humanity. You have to, t for you to pull the trigger on another human being, your humanity has to be taken from you. You have to devalue Life. Y'all ain't saying nothing. I'm telling you the truth. When you can, when, when somebody can, can literally take somebody else's life, that means that they have devalued that life. Now, whether it means that they devalued it based upon their own value of their life, whatever the case may be, but this is the way it is. So they desensitize them. Then they train them and program them to be so hardened that they can go through things that most people will lose their mind. Remember I gave you the example how they, 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 they literally try to drown them? 
You know why? Because eventually they plan on dropping them off in the middle of the ocean, giving them some type of directive and saying, go, go and do the job. You guys know what I'm talking about? They drop these guys off in the ocean. They put bombs on the bottom of ships. Y'all looking at me strange tonight. I, sometime, I, maybe I should, I, sometime I watch these, uh, these military shows and these documentaries, and it kind of shows me about human nature. They're hardened. They think that way. So the point I'm saying, if we think a certain way, our bodies will react in that way. It will behave that way. So what God is trying to do is help us to think so that we can, somebody say, walk in the spirit. Now, verses number six is going to reveal another point. If a person is carnal, they are actually guilty before God. Let's read verses number six. Read, for to be carnally minded is death. The reason why it's impossible to be carnal minded and be saved is because carnality does not produce life. It produces death because carnality is walking after the old nature. Can the church say amen? Read. But to be spiritually minded is life and what peace. What did Jesus tell his disciples in the uh, 14th chapter of the book of St. Uh, John? He says, my peace I leave you, my peace I give you. There's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Walking spiritually produces peace in our life. You follow what I'm saying? You see, when you are walking after the spirit, you don't live in conflict. See, if I'm walking in the spirit, I'm not going to be fussing and fighting with my wife all the time. Turning over and flipping over the table. People do this type of stuff. That's carnality. That's what that is. That's carnality. That's walking after the flesh. We at each other know this all day. Trying to prove who's right. That's the fallen nature. So these false prophets are teaching people, you can't overcome it, so therefore God will accept it. Yes, you can overcome it because Jesus condemned it in the flesh. He showed us how to overcome that which is in us. Can the church say amen? Praise the Lord. So I can't be feuding with my wife and fighting and hollering and screaming and saying I'm sanctified. Hallelujah! Y'all looking at me like I'm crazy. I'm telling you the truth. See, I'm saved. I'm supposed to be saved. So I, 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 I'm supposed to be able to come to harmonious, godly solutions within my life. Sometimes you just got to walk away. Amen. Go up the street. Go eat a, a Kit, Kit Kat bar or Hershey, whatever. Whatever you got, whatever mellows you out. Go do that. Praise the Lord. Go fish. Whatever you like to do. Calm yourself down. Get the church say hallelujah so you can make the rapture. I want to make the rapture. Amen? Amen. Sometimes we say, well, if they wouldn't have done this, it has nothing to do with them. Can the church say it has everything to do with me? It's nothing, Bishop, that you can do to me that's going to make me hurt you. You know why? Because I want to be saved. And it should be vice versa. You follow what I'm saying? That's the way we make it. Mm -hmm. Life and peace. Verses number seven. Let's read here. Now, this is going to make the point that the fallen nature is hostile. I want you to catch this now. It is hostile. It is an enemy. Your body hates God. Y'all looking at me like I'm crazy. Your flesh does not like what you making it do tonight. <laughs> it gets mad when you tell it it's got to pray. It's get mad when you tell it it has to fast. It get mad on Sunday morning when you tell it to get up. Can the church say hallelujah? Get to the house of God and give him the glory. It gets upset. We might as well be honest tonight. Can the church say amen? Praise the Lord. See, sometimes we don't want to be honest with ourselves. I can remember years ago, one day, I told you this uh, not too long ago, I, was, I had a long day of work. I probably was driving all over the state or something, and I was exhausted. And I just felt like, Lord, I deserve a break. I, I come to all the Bible classes. I just deserve sharing to stay home tonight. So I called Bishop because I, I, I thought I was going to get some help because he know I'm always there. So I said, Bishop, you know, I, I'm extremely exhausted tonight. Uh, you know, I feel like I need to stay at home and just take it easy. 
True to form. Bishop was walking in the spirit. <laughs> and he said, son, it's one thing if you're sick and you're incapacitated. But if God has given you strength, you need to make your way to church. <laughs> and know what I did? Made your way to I made my way to church. What he was telling me is walk in the spirit. That's what he was telling me. Because the flesh would tell you to stay home and watch the Three Stooges or whatever you like to watch. Because I used to like, when I was a kid, I loved the Three Stooges. This was my, my favorite show. Praise the Lord. I just loved it. They would, just, they would just crack me up. But in any case, I had to what? Make a decision. I can remember coming to church and looking in the pulpit and thought I saw three people. I was so exhausted. It looked like Bishop was doing, you know how things go out of focus when you're so tired? I'm, I'm telling the truth. I was looking up there. I'm trying to figure out what is going on. And I'm doing all of this, and you know how we do. Some of us don't even do that. We just go to sleep. Praise the Lord. We just say, forget it. Lord knows. We just, give, we just give, get a fight up and just go to bed. Amen. At least you were here. All right. In any case, this is the way it is. All right? So this is to make the point. I'm being a little bit comical tonight because this is a, this is a very, 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 very hard subject. Praise the Lord. I don't want anybody to feel like the pastor's being rough. But simply to make the point that the devil wants you to think that carnality is okay. He wants me to think that I can stroke my flesh and I'll be okay. And this is what the false prophets teach. My dad told you about the gentleman that went to his pastor. This individual went to his pastor because he was really trying to do the right thing. He said, I don't like keep falling and can't seem to overcome this. And the pastor looked at him as he was smoking a cigar in his office. That ought to give you some signs that he need to go somewhere else. But the pastor was sitting there smoking his stogie and told him, well, it's all right. Just sow your wild oats. He's a false prophet. Can the church say amen? amen. You see what I'm saying? Because th this is what people teach. It's okay. You can't stop it so God understands he overlook it. God is not going to overlook anything. The Bible said in the days of old he winked at. The term wink, it means he looked away at the ignorance of men. But now calleth all men everywhere to repent. Why? Because he's condemned it in the flesh. He's now giving us a way out. There was a time when they didn't know they couldn't do better. So he had to, to a certain degree look away at their ignorance. It's just like your children. If I told you five times that this is not the way you wash the dishes, and you keep washing them, if you wash another dish and it's dirty, then you're going to deal with me. You're going to pray, because no one wants to be eating, and all of a sudden they look up and it's something that you didn't put on your plate there. You're not going to look away at it, is you? You're going to say, oh, okay, I know I didn't put that fried, it's been there. No, you eating, you, you, you know, you eating the steak and then you got uh, something else on your plate. You're not going to look away at that. Praise the Lord. God is the same way, saints. Can I be practical tonight? God doesn't look away at everything. He sees all things. The Bible said all things are open before him with whom we have to do. He sees it. And he is not going to ignore it. Go to church say hallelujah. You follow what I'm saying? The Lord is not blind. He sees all. All right? Uh, what did I tell you? Verses number seven. All right? Because the carnal mind is... Enmity, the term enmity means it's hostile or it is an enemy against God for it is not subject to the law of God because the carnal mind is produced out of the carnal nature. It is the flesh. You see, the, 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 the fallen nature is not subject to the, to the law of God. It's not subject to spirituality. The flesh is not spiritual at all. Zero. The Bible said in the flesh dwell is what? No good thing. People say, I got, I, it's good in me. The only good thing you have in you is the Holy Spirit. Everything else is going back to the dust. Praise the Lord. Let me show you that in your Bible. Praise the Lord. Somebody say, Pastor, you, you're being rough tonight. Good. I'm just being a little bit facetious. Let's go now to third chapter. Let me show you the law that is in these memories. Third chapter of, let me see here, um, Genesis. Praise the Lord. Genesis chapter number three. 
And let me see what verse I want you. I think it's around 19. Yes, this is the fate of the flesh. Praise the Lord. This is the fate of what is going to take place with these bodies. Can the church say amen? Genesis chapter 3, verses numbers 19. Mm -hmm. This is the curse that is upon the body. And what God is doing right now is that he's temporarily adopted your body into his family. Into your soul. Praise the Lord. Or into you, we have come into a place of perfection and we're ready to be taken with him. That's the only use of your body. So you clothe it, you feed it, you take care of it, but make sure you keep it on warning. Can the church say amen? Mm-hmm. Let's read verse 19 here. In the sweat of your face shall, shall I eat bread. What he's saying is from this point forward, because of the transgression of Adam, that everything that we get, we're going to have to earn it. Because in the garden, it was a utopia. Man did not have to work for his keep. God took care of him. Adam was actually simply a keeper of the goods of God and or a steward. You follow what I'm saying? But because he did not steward the right way, God put him out and put a curse upon the ground. Follow what I'm saying? So the reason why we got to, brothers and sisters, we got to go to work. You know why? Because of Adam. Praise the Lord. It, it, it ain't your fault. Don't blame yourself. It's Adam. Give the church say amen. Mm-hmm. Read. Till thou return unto the ground. Where is the, what, 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 what will carnality produce? Death. Where is the body going? To the ground. Carnality is in the members. So when these false prophets teach that carnal saints will be saved, actually what they're teaching is false doctrine. They're teaching them to walk after the flesh will produce salvation. That's foolishness. To walk after the flesh produces what? Death. It is an enemy. I'm trying to drive this home tonight. I only got a few, few, few moments tonight, and then we're going to be off of this. We'll deal with the second principle next, next week, second and third. But the point is simply this. The devil wants you to, to make you think that it's okay to love your body to the extent where you let it do whatever it wants to do. Can the church say amen? Tell that to the woman who has a husband who don't want to act right. No, no, you're supposed to love me. So I said, I love my body. Let me give you an example to show you this. This came to my mind when I was in my office. To show you how people can make an excuse that excuses for themselves that they won't even accept if somebody else did. If, if, if we say that we will not accept a person that has a covenant with us, such as in marriage, defiling their covenant. You understand what I'm saying? We won't accept that. How much more will God accept? You understand what I'm saying? See, people want God to accept things that they don't accept. You will tell somebody, look, I'm your wife. You my husband. You belong to me. Can't God say we're his children? Hallelujah. I'm his son. And you belong to me, and you're supposed to follow my laws? You follow what I'm saying? See, when the shoe is on the other foot, people want to act like it ain't no problem. Amen. You follow what I'm saying? See, God does not accept everything that people do. But we are living in a world where well, you mean that old song before we were sanctified, it's your thing, do what you want to do? That's, don't listen to it now, praise the Lord. You're supposed to be saved. <laughs> Amen. See, that's the, that's the day we live in, Bishop. Well, because they're teaching this in school, that you are a universe within yourself. You are an autonomous agent. That means you, 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 the world and everything revolves around your will and what you want. So people walk around as though everything is about what they feel and nobody else matters. So they can trample over other people's feelings and other people's um, space. 
and don't care about what anybody thinks. You know why? Because they've been taught that it's all about them. It's not all about me. It's all about God's will. Praise the Lord. And if Adam was thinking about the, the, the success of the human family, he would obey God. But now, because of the carnality that was in him, because what, know what he did? He did not follow after God. He followed after his own nature. He looked at what he was going to receive in staying with his wife, because you know what happened to Eve? When she ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, what happened to her? Her eyes were open. She were as uh, gods, small g, or the fallen angels, knowing what is good and evil. And she received a fallen nature. And so what actually was going to happen, either Adam was going to walk with God or he was going to lose his wife. And we all know what he chose. And when God came to him, he made an honest confession to God about what he did. Praise the Lord. But yet and still there was consequences for what he did. And now look at us today. We got to work. We get tired. Praise the Lord. We go on diets and they don't work. All of these type of things. I'm just trying to be a little bit. But you get the picture, don't you? That is because of the carnality. So there's nothing that can be produced out of the fallen nature but more of the same. You follow what I'm saying? So what God is doing now, he's trying to teach us to walk in the spirit. To walk in, uh, in, in, in such a way so that God can be glorified in our life so that we could be with him when he comes. Can the church say amen? Let's finish reading this. Um, Unto the ground, for out of it was thou taken, for dust thou art, and thus shall thou return. We're going to return right back to where we came from. And the one thing I know about life is that when you die, everybody leaves you. I've never seen anybody jump in the casket with somebody when they were getting ready to get out of here. They actually pull all that. Sometimes they put all these trinkets on them. They pull all that stuff off of them. Because you don't, the, dead, the dead don't need it. You ever saw that when the family comes up and gathers around the thing? They're pulling stuff off of them sometimes. Y'all looking at me like this, this stuff happens. You know why? Because that body is going right back to the dust. But if we walk in the spirit, do not obey the lust of the flesh, we will see him when he comes. Let's go back and let's finish this up and then we'll deal with uh, our second portion on next week. Two and three. We'll deal with two and three next week so we can uh, wrap this up. Let's read verses numbers eight. Uh, yes, verses numbers eight. Read. So, uh, so then they which are in the flesh cannot. So if they that are in the flesh cannot please God, why do people teach and are deceived that carnality is acceptable in the sight of God? When Paul clearly says they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Now, the term please has to do with us being able to fulfill his good pleasure. Now, what pleases God? Faith. Faith in what? His word. For without faith, it is impossible to what? Please God. See, if I have faith in God's word, I will obey his word. I got faith. I faith. I got all, I, my faith is great. The only faith that these people got nowadays is faith to get a house, faith to get a car, faith to get some money in their pocket. I got all this faith. But you ain't got enough faith to say no to the body. You ain't got enough faith to go home at night. You ain't got enough faith to say, no, I'm not going to, to uh, obey my flesh. I'm going to walk with God and live right. That's real faith. When you got, when, when I, I talk about me, when I got to tell myself no, that's real faith. That's real belief. When I got to say no to what I want, that's a real faith. When I got to tell myself, no, you can't overcome. No, you can't walk with God. No, you can't be saved. No, you can't love your neighbor. No, you can't love your wife. No, you can't love your brother. No, you can't love the saints. That's faith. But the only time that people talk about faith now is, Lord, I need this. Well, the Bible said he knoweth what you have need before you ask. You, God wants me to please him. Can the church say hallelujah? You follow what I'm trying to say tonight? If a, the Bible said when a man's ways please what? 
the Lord, he will make his enemies be at peace with him. Set your affections upon the Lord and please him. And he will give you what? The desires of your heart within his will. Yes, he will. God is there for us, saints. And we're going to close this portion here. There's more I could be said on that, but we don't want to belabor it. So the first deception that the enemy tries to bring to the church is that carnal Christians will be saved. People that walk in the flesh can make the journey. But we just showed you in these scriptures and a number of scriptures that we showed you last week that to be to walk in the flesh is actually an enmity against God. An example of that would be um, Balaam. Balaam was an example of carnality because he was a prophet for gain. The only thing he was concerned about is what he could receive. He wanted to use his gift to profit himself. And when he could not curse the people of God, if you want to read that, you go back to uh, Numbers. Uh, you could probably read around Numbers 31, uh, 1 through uh, 17. You can get a gist of what happened to him. Because actually what happened to him is that he was slain. Moses, I think, gave the order to have him uh, executed. Because he actually taught Balak to cast a stumbling block upon, uh, upon the children of uh, Israel when he could not curse them. You follow what I'm saying? Why did he do it? He wanted some money. That's an example of carnality. Some people will do everything to get what they want and not let God be glorified. Anybody have any questions tonight as we close here? Any questions?